Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this webinar by the National Bank of Belgium. And the reason for holding this webinar, it is at the occasion of the publication of our new 2024 issue of our FMI and payment services reports. Uh, now, this FMI report, it is being published by the National Bank of Belgium uh, under its current format since 2017 on a yearly basis. Um, and it is the third year in a row that we also have a webinar that combines the publication of the reports. Um, as you know, um, Belgium is hosting quite some important financial market infrastructures, custodians, payment service providers and critical service providers. And with this yearly report and webinar, we want to update you on the bank's role in the oversight and the prudential supervision of these entities. Uh, the report, it talks about our activities in the past year, as well as regulatory and environmental evolutions with an impact on the companies in the sector. We are talking here about a report of about 100 pages, and it, would be, it will be published later today on our website. Now, the report is quite extensive. Um, we cannot cover all of the topics in today's webinar, but we decided um, to, to uh, present to you uh, four topics, um, a summary of highlights. Um, me and uh, my colleagues will present you the following uh, four topics in the next hour. Um, first, I will uh, talk about SWIFT, which is a financial messaging service provider located here in Belgium and on which the National Bank of Belgium is coordinating the oversight by the global central banking community. That's the first topic. Um, the second topic is about ESG. As central bank, uh, we pay increasing attention to environmental and climate-related risks, also at FMIs. And this second topic will be uh, covered by my colleague Torin today. Um, now, when we look back to 2023, uh, of course, we could not escape the geopolitical context and how that has led to further international sanctions against Russia. Um, and my colleague Janice will elaborate on how this is affecting Euroclear Bank. And finally, the fourth topic that will be covered by my colleague Schofre um, will uh, talk about the EU's DORA Act, Digital Operational Resilience. What are the details of the DORA Act? and how is the NBB adapting its supervisory methodologies in the run-up of the implementation of DORA. Um, so these four topics is what we have in mind for you for the next hour. Um, maybe on logistics before we start, let me remind you that we will do four presentations first and then the Q&A session will follow right after the four presentations. Um, if you want to raise a question for us, um, on uh, any of the presentations, please click on the Q&A button that you have on your screen. screen. Um, you can type the question there and then send it to us. And we hope we can answer as many questions as possible uh, during the session. So with that, um, I think I would like to move to the first topic that we will be covering today. Um, and that is um, SWIFT and the oversight conducted on SWIFT by the National Bank of Belgium. Um, now, um, I guess that for this audience, um, um, most of you are familiar with SWIFT and what SWIFT is doing. Um, but still, um, I uh, put some figures on this slide underscoring the importance of SWIFT. So first, maybe to reiterate or clarify, SWIFT itself, it's not a financial institution. Um, it's not a financial market infrastructure, but it is a critical service provider to many financial market infrastructures. So actually, SWIFT is an IT company providing financial messaging services to FMIs and financial institutions. The main application that they have for that, um, it is called FIN, um, and there are actually around 12 billion such messages that are being sent from financial institution to financial institution on a yearly basis. They are active in more than 200 countries and territories, and there are more than fi 12,000 financial institutions that are connected to SWIFT. So that already 
shows a bit the importance of SWIFT as an organization. Now, um, they facilitate cross-border payments, um, correspondent banking, um, but they are also carrying over their networks many other types of, of messages. Um, it's not only for payments, but also for securities transactions um, that they conduct uh, a lot of messaging, also for treasury and trade. Um, so next to payments, a lot of market infrastructures, both in the area of payments and securities, are also relying on SWIFT for their messaging. Um, and these can be various types of market infrastructures. So I've listed a couple of them here. It can be high value or low value payment systems like a uh, real-time gross settlement system and an RTGS system, target to you or target today. It can be automated clearing houses or low value payment systems um, or also real-time payment systems. Uh, we can think about uh, the Australian uh, platform um, for faster payments. Also in the securities area, a lot of regulatory reporting and reporting messages um, are conducted uh, via the systems of SWIFT. So all of this, in a way, is underscoring uh, the importance of SWIFT, um, and that importance of SWIFT also didn't go unnoticed um, by the central banks. And for that reason, um, the central banks decided already a while ago um, to set up oversight on SWIFT. Now, um, oversight really is a, cr uh, a central bank concept. Um, it's not that SWIFT is prudentially supervised today, so this is not regulation. Um, but because of the importance for the international, the global financial system, um, the central banks decided, oh, we want to have a closer look on this organization, um, the activity, it is called uh, oversight. Um, we conduct that as a central bank with an international community of central banks since 2004. So then uh, the international cooperative oversight arrangements were set up um, on SWIFT with the NBB in the role of lead overseer um, because um, SWIFT is headquartered in Belgium. Now that activity is not conducted solely by the National Bank of Belgium, but we coordinate these activities jointly with the central banks of the G10. Um, now um, we are having a protocol um, with SWIFT that is organizing and setting up um, the arrangements of that oversight. That bilateral protocol by the National Bank of Belgium with SWIFT is being backed up by memoranda of understanding that we have with each of the participating central banks. Now, um, these are the G10 central banks, but that also includes the European Central Bank. Um, that framework is in place since 2004. It was expanded uh, since 2012 with a wider group of central banks. Um, there was a first expansion in 2012, a second one in 2019. Um, these central banks participate in our activities um, through a group called the SWIFT Oversight Forum. Um, in total, it compares to the setup of the G20 central banks that you also might know from the Basel Committee uh, uh, for Banking Supervision. Um, so it's a similar setup of participating central banks in our oversight of SWIFT. Um, and here again, um, the relationship with each of these participating central banks is being organized through MOUs. Now, um, the motivation um, for this oversight is the criticality for payment systems of this critical service provider, SWIFT. Um, there are not that many critical service providers on which there is direct oversight around the world. Um, so it does exist also with an Italian company called Nexi here in, the, in, in Europe, um, and that is under the lead of the Banca d'Italia. But except for that, um, it's quite rare to have direct oversight on critical service providers. Most often, um, critical service providers need to uh, submit information if they work for financial institutions through the financial institutions that need to ask information from them. Um, 
Now, the concept for this oversight that we have um, is called moral suasion. So it's not with hard law today. Uh, there's no law underpinning um, our activities of oversight. And it is, modify, uh, it is motivated um, because of um, the importance um, to the central banks of the smooth functioning of, of the payment systems. So that's the rationale that has been included um, in the protocol to motivate our oversight on SWIFT. Um, now, let me talk a bit about the framework um, that we are having today to conduct our oversight on SWIFT. Actually, there's a framework that was developed by these central banks, which are called the five high-level expectations for the oversight of SWIFT. Um, and you see them listed here. Now, in essence, we are always talking about operational risk and continuity of operations of SWIFT. That's what is of interest to us. So we look very much to operational risk, business continuity, and the resilience of services provided by SWIFT. And looking to the list of the five high-level expectations, um, high-level expectations two, three, and four, information security, reliability, and resilience, and technology planning, um, they really focus on these aspects of operational risk. But next to that, um, we also look to the more wide, enterprise-wide risk management of the organization, and that is captured um, by high-level expectation one, risk identification and management. Um, and similarly, um, there is high-level expectation five, communication with users, um, and we decided to have that element in the framework because of the many endpoints that um, SWIFT has. Um, so we indicate that there are more than 10,000 endpoints, a lot of customers across the globe. If there are technology migrations or customer uh, informations to be shared, it's very much important that this is being conducted in a well-organized way, being able um, to address the needs of very small uh, but also very large customers that are working on to SWIFT. Um, now, that framework that we apply today was adopted by the overseers of the G10, and these have been included in what has become the Bible of oversight for financial market infrastructures, the uh, PFMIs, the Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures, which have been issued by CPMI and IOSCO already back in 2012. Um, this framework is part of it, and it is under Annex F, the approach to critical service providers as part of these principles for financial market infrastructures. Um, now, what are the services that we then look at at SWIFT? Well, the messaging application FIN, of course, and then also the underlying networks, uh, SWIFTnet. These are the core activities that we are looking at. Um, however, um, the product portfolio of SWIFT has been evolving over the past years, um, and so it's also important for us to monitor how that portfolio is evolving. For instance, there's a whole uh, financial crime and compliance portfolio that has been added over recent years. We always need to reflect, like, um, well, how important um, are these new services, or can they introduce any operational risk for the core services um, that we have under our oversight. Um, and so when, when we look um, over the years how this oversight has evolved, um, we continue to focus on operational risk, even if our expectations have been evolving and what exactly we request from SWIFT has been evolving. Um, we talk about operational risk, um, but over the years we've had more uh, attention for cyber resilience of the organization, or we also decided to include um, the review and the monitoring of the SWIFT customer security program that focuses on the cyber hygiene at the side of the customers for the connectivity uh, to SWIFT. Now, I've been talking about the framework that we are applying today, uh, moral suasion, um, where we need to convince SWIFT on the basis of a framework provided by five high-level expectations. Um, what is new in this year's report is that we announced that we are currently 
reviewing as the overseers um, the framework that we adopt and uh, apply um, to SWIFT for conducting our oversight of SWIFT. So there will be a few changes um, going forward. Um, the major change is that we will be moving from moral suasion to hard law. So there will be a Belgian law underpinning our activities um, um, with the idea um, that we will codify much more than what is the case through the five high le level expe expectations today, the requirements that we put onto SWIFT. Um, now, the discussions on this have been going on for a while now within our community of overseeing central banks. Um, we decide that we want to maintain the features of the oversight that we consider to be functioning well in terms of international cooperation and organization. So the international working groups that we have for conducting that oversight, they will be maintained. But it is very clear that going forward, um, the NBB as lead overseer, we will become um, the legally designated authority with ultimate responsibility and accountability for the enforcement of the envisioned Belgian law. Um, now, what is part of the framework? Um, we will inspire our, ourselves very much on the text of the principles for financial market infrastructures. So earlier on, I was indicating that only Annex F is applied to SWIFT, but we revised in detail the entire PFMIs to see what can apply or should apply to a critical service provider like SWIFT. And then, of course, in the meantime, we have taken into account also other relevant frameworks that have developed or have been fine-tuned in the past years, um, which includes, for instance, um, the, the cyber resilience guidance that was issued by CPMI and IOSCO in 2016, or the work that has been conducted by the Eurosystem um, on the cyber resilience oversight expectations. Uh, last but not, not least, um, in the European context, I think that I also need to mention DORA, the Digital Operational uh, Resilience Act that Chefre will be talking about later. Um, SWIFT as a critical service provider, um, they fall not within the scope of DORA, um, but it is important that we maintain a level playing field in terms of what the expectations are for financial institutions that are in scope of DORA, and then also um, what we expect from SWIFT. Um, so this is the information that we wanted to share with you on the oversight of SWIFT. Um, let's now move to the second topic in our presentations, and I pass the floor to Doreen, who will be talking you, to you about climate risk at FMIs. Good afternoon, everyone. We I will talk a bit about climate risk. And the first slide is just an introduction. All over the world, different types of weather events occur. And what will happen if the frequency and or the severity of these extreme weather events will continue to increase? Which risk and challenges do market infrastructures face? And which measures do they take? This presentation will briefly discuss the follow-up the MBB has performed with regards to this topic. This timeline just shows the actions performed by the MBB with regards to the follow-up of climate risks. Some of the market infrastructures also have a banking license. As a result, after the publication of the ECB guide on climate and environmental risks for banks, these FMIs with a banking license were also part of the re MBB and ECB reviews performed from a banking supervision perspective. And these reviews are shown on top of this slide. Below the line, you can see the actions that the MBB has undertaken focusing on the FMI perspective. In 2021, begin 2022, the MBB has sent the first questionnaire to a set of financial market infrastructures, payment institutions, and critical service providers. The results of this first questionnaire were published in the 2022 Financial Market Infrastructure Report. 
a set of general expectations regarding the management of climate risks at financial market infrastructures was published in the 2023 Financial Market Infrastructure Report. In June of last year, a new questionnaire was sent to a set of institutions. The responses of this, re of this questionnaire were compared with the general expectations published in 2023. And the results of this review will be discussed further in this presentation. The reviews and the assessments and the questionnaires were structured around five assessment teams. Firstly, materiality assessment. When institutions do assess to which exposures they are exposed, do they also take into account climate risks? Further, do they also integrate climate risks within the risk appetite and the risk management within the governance setup and within the business strategy and their analysis of the business environment? And finally, public disclosures. Do they also publish information and which type of information do they publish with regards to the management of climate risks within the institution. What were the results of the 2023 review? In general, institutions are aware of climate risks. However, the integration of climate risks within the risk management and the business strategy still needs improvement. Climate risks are embedded at least at an advocate level in the governance framework of the surveyed institutions and we will come back to governance in the next slides. In general, the institutions have an adequate to strong level of understanding of the materiality of climate risks. As most of the institutions have processes in place to capture climate risks in their materiality assessment. However, we notice that there are differences in the level of the embedment within the enterprise risk framework. For example, some of the institutions still had to integrate climate risks within the risk taxonomy. Most of the institutions also publish on a regular basis a set of sustainability information. But this information is still quite high level from time to time. The embeddedness within the business strategy and risk management is still an area of improvement. Although climate risks are at least at a high level or at an, or at an ad hoc basis present, improvements are needed to reach a full and a structural integration of climate risks within the business strategy and risk management. However, we have to mention that several of the institutions already, already mentioned improvements which were already ongoing or planned at several at the moment of the survey. Climate risks are in general not considered as a separate risk category, such as operational risk, credit risk, business risks are, but as a driver of other risk types. In general, the, inf the institutions do not see a material impact of climate risks at the short term, but they listed potential risks and impacts at the medium to long term. And these were mainly situated at the level of operational risk, business risk, and reputational and legal risk. Some examples, more service disruptions at the own organization level and at the level of the third service providers, a limited capacity of data centers to function in extreme heat, unavailability of staff, as for example, staff can also be hit by weather events and higher energy prices and higher energy costs, not only due to higher energy prices, but also due to higher energy needs. Think for example, to increase need for cooling. And also an impact on the reputation if the institutions fail to deliver to the targets and the commitments they have set. Looking at the business model, the institutions have defined several potential impacts, not only higher costs and impact on business disruptions, but also impact at the product level. However, the institutions have also mentioned several mitigating measures, and these were mainly situated in the domains of measuring and monitoring, such as setting targets, implementing double materiality assessments, energy-related actions, such as actions to reduce energy costs as renewable energy, replacing equipment by more energy efficient equipment and third party related initiatives like in implementing ESG factors in the assessment of new clients and new service third party service providers. 
When looking at governance, institutions have in general integrated the management of climate risks within the existing structure, ranging from the business level up to the board level. An example, some of the institutions have changed the mandate of the board and management committees to introduce a responsibility for climate risks. And these are often complemented by additional actions, like setting up ESG steering committees and specific ESG roles who will be responsible for the transversal implementation and coordination of climate-related actions within the organization. Regarding the monitoring of the impact of climate risks on business and the risk profile, the key performance indicators and key risk indicators to regulatory monitor the impact of climate risks have already been developed by certain institutions, but were in the process of being implemented at others. Besides some examples, existing KPIs and KRIs were mainly related to the measurement of the firm's carbon footprint. As said, the full integration of climate risks within the risk management and risk appetite is still an attention point and currently work in progress at several of the surveyed institutions. However, there also are also some positive, positive elements. For example, climate risks are already adequately integrated within the business continuity management. As next steps, we continue to follow up on climate risks, not only via global reviews, such as the one of 2023, but also via more in-depth analysis where we will focus on a specific topic. And the MBB will engage to contribute to the international work and international in initiatives set for this field. Then I will now pass the word to Janice, who will tell you more about the Russian sanctions and the impact of the sanctions. Thank you, Doreen. So the aim of my presentation, as just said, will be to provide some more information on uh, um, the sanctions against Russia and the impact that this has had on European Bank, as well as to provide some um, information on some of the numbers as well as regulatory developments. But before diving into the substantive part of the presentation, I first want to start by saying that uh, the National Bank of Belgium is not the competent sanctions authority. That competency lies um, with the Treasury. We, on the other hand, um, are responsible for the oversight of financial market infrastructures, and that includes, importantly, Euroclear Bank. As an international central securities depository, Euroclear Bank connects uh, international investors um, its participants to uh, more than 50 countries. It does so by um, having market links with um, other national central securities depositories, uh, which then facilitate the settlement of securities transactions. Um, that facilitates uh, the, the settlement of those transactions across borders. Now, to give you an idea on the size of Euroclear Bank, um, Euroclear Bank is responsible for safekeeping securities worth 18 trillion euros. Um, it counts 1,800 participants that come from more than 110 jurisdictions. So those numbers clearly show not only the, the central position of Euroclear Bank in the financial ecosystem, but also the critical or systemic importance of uh, the firm, which in turn also um, shows uh, why our role as overseer in looking at the sound and prudent management of such a firm is so important. And also, finally, it uh, shows the relevance of our financial stability mandate. Now, to link this back to uh, the sanctions, uh, given the financial footprint of Euroclear Bank, Euroclear Bank has had connections with Russia at multiple levels, and that includes the fact that one of its participants is the Central Bank of Russia. This has meant that uh, Euroclear Bank has been instrumental in the implementation of sanctions, which required it to uh, freeze or immobilize sanctioned assets. And ultimately, 
This has also meant that uh, Euroclear Bank recorded uh, important revenues. And it is um, that link between the uh, application of the uh, sanction regulation to the generation of revenues that I want to speak a bit more in detail about how we come from one to the other. So everything starts uh, with the application of sanctions, mean, meaning the freezing or the immobilization of sanctioned securities um, and sanctioned cash. However, with time also um, the sanctioned securities turn into cash that stay within a Euroclear bank as during the lifetime of um, a security there are different cash events. During the life cycle of a security there are coupon or dividend payments and then at the end of the life cycle at maturity there is the redemption of the security and so all of this comes into Euroclear Bank and has to stay in Euroclear Bank um, in view of the application of the sanctions. This then um, increases the balance sheet of Euroclear Bank and also means that um, throughout uh, the application of the sanctions um, that uh, those cash balances form part of Euroclear Bank's estate. Euroclear Bank therefore has to reinvest um, the cash balances from a risk management perspective and also um, uh, to reduce capital requirements. It does so by reinvesting and um, given the high interest rate environment of the past two years, this has generated quite some important returns. Now it's important to note that the application of sanctions does not modify um, the entitlement or claim in restitution related to sanctioned assets. They are only suspended. And in addition, in view of the regulatory status of Euroclear Bank as a CSD, Euroclear Bank does not um, remunerate the cash balances that stay within its system. Um, and for that reason, then, um, while the principal coupon and dividend um, have to be restituted once sanctions would be lifted, um, the, the revenues made from the reinvestment are a part of Euroclear Bank's estate and hence part of the, of the PNL. Um, on the next slide, we see uh, the increase in the balance sheet more clearly through this graph. We can see that um, around 160 billion euro um, of worth of increase are linked to the sanctioned Russian assets. Uh, as I said, in, um, the, the cash balances are then reinvested and this generated revenues in 2023. It has uh, generated a pre-tax um, net, uh, uh, pre net revenue of 4.4 billion euros. Um, also in 2023, 75% of uh, the net profit of Euroclear Bank has been related to the reinvestment revenues of sanctioned cash. But um, to have the full picture, it's also important to say that um, those revenues do not come without costs and do not come without risks. For 2023, for example, um, additional costs related to the application of sanctions and the endurance of countermeasures has um, amounted to six, 62 million euros. Now, this may not uh, sound as much uh, in comparison to the 4.4 billion, but 62 uh, million is of course still very important. And um, on top of this come um, uh, some of the risks that are related to the application of sanctions and that importantly includes um, operational compliance but also legal risk um, as we are seeing that uh, various parties are uh, bringing claims to court in Russia where they are contesting the consequences of the application of the sanctions, um, asking for compensation for the, the sanctioned securities, the sanctioned cash, but also for opportunity losses and um, uh, damages. And, the, um, and to add to this, uh, maybe still that uh, the, fine, the, the extent of this risk will only be known in the long term as those legal cases evolve and uh, come up over time. At the moment, we see that there are around 100 court cases. 
Now, on recent regulatory developments, in the first half of the year, the EU adopted two legal acts um, which established a mechanism for the transfer of uh, net profits related to the reinvestment of um, cash of the Central Bank of Russia, um, starting after the 15th of February. With the first legal act, um, the, EU, the EU codified the obligation that um, CSDs have to account for and manage uh, the Russian sanctioned assets as well as the, the net profits related to it separately and also codified the prohibition to pay out um, any dividend related to this. Now, I have to say for the avoidance of doubt that EuroClear Bank had already been complying with uh, those requirements, but in this way, the Legal Act paved the ground for the second council regulation, which made the financial contribution um, uh, to the EU, um, to, to the Ukraine facility much more concrete. So it foresees that 99.7% of net profits uh, related to the reinvestment of um, cash of the Central Bank of Russia will be transferred to the Ukraine facility, but it also recognizes, as I said before, uh, that there are risks and um, costs related to it. And for that reason, it foresees that 10% of the financial contribution could be provisionally uh, retained, and it can be also more depending on the circumstances. Now, on um, the current discussions um, at G7 level, at a meeting in June, it was decided by um, G7 jurisdictions that uh, one could foresee that the uh, unexpected and extraordinary uh, profits um, that I just talked about could be used for the repayment of a $50 billion loan. Um, now, the G7 jurisdictions agreed on the principle uh, so that means that the, the details still have to be worked out. Um, um, but one could say that the work that the EU has done up until now has really paved the, the, the way for, um, for, such, uh, for such a measure. Now, before um, I conclude on my concluding remarks, I also want to say that um, what I was uh, saying in the beginning about how the application of the sanctions ultimately lead to the generation of revenues, um, what we're talking about when we're talking about a financial contribution to Ukraine, we're really talking about a financial contribution of a CSD. Uh, because the difference has to be made between um, the, the principal, the coupon dividend and the revenues, we really cannot speak about a seizure of assets of the Central Bank of Russia. And now finally, um, I, I think it is clear to say that we remain in uncharted territory and that it is crucial for us as overseer to continue monitoring it going forward. And with this, I give the word to my colleague Joffre. Thank you, Janice. Hello, everyone. My name is Schofre Verhoeven. This next topic in our presentation, DORA, is one that we at the National Bank have been working on for over four years. Every once in a while, a new legislation comes along that constitutes a big step forward for a specific sector or an entire market. The Consumer Rights Act, uh, the Consumer Rights Directive, was enacted in 2011. The Payment Service Directive was rolled out in 2007. GDPR was adopted in 2016, and 2025 will be known as the year of the Digital Operational Resilience Act. This act will facilitate a more stable, safe, resilient digital landscape within, within the financial sector for years to come. Today, it is my privilege to explain DORA to you. Now, the Act itself contains 64 articles, resulting in almost 100 pages of legislative text, and we have 10 minutes. So, suffice it to say that this will be a very brief summation of what DORA is. However, by the time I step away from this stand, you should all understand the fundamentals of DORA and the essence of this new legislation. 
To get us all on the same page, let's start with the title, the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Resilience is the ability to withstand or persevere through difficulties. Operational resilience means that this act focuses on the resilience of operations, and more specifically, we are talking about the resilience of digital operations. This means digital transactions, online platforms, mobile apps, but also back-end operations such as digital reconciliation or batch jobs. If your conclusion to that summation is that almost all operations in the financial sector are digital, then you're correct, which is one of the many reasons why this act is such an important piece of legislation. Now, to really understand DORA, we first need to ask ourselves one fundamental question. Why? Why is this act being rolled out? And the straightforward answer is that in an ever-evolving digital landscape in the financial sector, a more resilient and stronger and more effective piece of legislation is required. The digital landscape of a mere decade ago is almost incomparable to the situation today, which is far more complex and multiple times more dynamic. Year after year, the number of digital transactions increase exponentially, and year after year, the amount of money transferred increases in a similar manner. Also, more and more operations are being digitalized. This continuous evolution necessitates improved legislation. Or to make an oversimplified comparison, if it sounds logical that a safe containing more money also needs to be more secure, then it stands to reason that today's digital financial sector also requires a more effective legislation. And this is where DORA comes in. DORA is more comprehensive it offers new tools to us to fulfill our mandate more effectively. It will be the basis of a homogenous approach to supervision on digital resilience in a single EU market. It is a single, solid, legislative piece that will support a safe and stable digital financial sector. Now that we know more about the reasons behind DORA and the circumstances around it, let's explore the contents of the Act. As previously mentioned, DORA is wonderfully comprehensive, but in summation, the Act is based on five key pillars. The first pillar, the first pillar focuses on governance and risk management. Based on tried and tested sectoral standards, guidelines and recommendations, these articles highlight the importance of policy and robust organizational framework. In fact, it is often through approved policies and implemented frameworks that we as supervisors get a first hint of the commitment that an organization has to digital resilience. Dora also describes functions in ICT risk management, such as identification, protection and prevention of risk, detection, response and recovery from breaches and failures, training and development so that teams can remain on the forefront of new trends and best practices, and communication with key stakeholders. All of these functions should be adequately filled in to support effective risk management, and this is the first pillar of DORA. Now, with everything in place, testing of operational resilience is the second pillar. It is vital to periodically assess the resilience against cyber attacks, to identify gaps, and to rapidly implement any necessary corrective actions as a result. While all financial entities require to sub are required to subject their ICT systems to testing, ranging from uh, analyzing software to scanning for vulnerabilities, some entities are required to perform advanced threat-led penetration testing. But these entities are specifically identified by the competent authorities. So with these two pillars, we have covered internal operations. And internal here is the key word because financial institutions don't operate in a vacuum. They work in an environment with various agents. Now more than ever, financial organizations rely on external parties for a variety of services, including IT services. And increasingly, we see financial institutions opting for a cloud-first strategy. But just as with internal services, these external ser services might be essential to your operation which is why they are subject to digital resilience risk. 
Third-party risk management is the third pillar of DORA. DORA provides sound principles on how third-party risks should be monitored and provides regulation that harmonizes the key elements of service provision and the relationship with, ex with external ICT providers. On top of that, DORA establishes an EU oversight, fra oversight framework on critical ICT party service providers. So, with these three pillars, we have covered the internal and external operations, and we still have two pillars left. Up until this point, we have protected ourselves well against difficulties. We have increased our resilience as high as we reasonably can. But with all that in place, if something were to happen, then we, the supervisors, must know immediately. The fourth pillar is supervisory reporting of incidents. The mission of the NBB is to maintain a strong and stable financial sector. And in that endeavor, we want the communication channels to be as short and streamlined as possible. Especially when it comes to urgent and important topics, such as ICT-related incidents and significant cyber threats. The fourth pillar is a full-spectrum full spectrum clarification on what needs to be reported and how. How ICT-related incidents should be managed and classified, to whom they should be reported, in which format, and so on. However, the fourth pillar details more than that. As supervisors, we also have a responsibility in upholding the efficacy of these communication channels. It is up to us to provide guidance and to provide feedback to financial institutions. And it is up to us to transmit relevant data to other authorities who have a legitimate interest. That way, Financial institutions only need to concern themselves with reporting to one authority. Now, the fourth pillar also leads us to the fifth and final pillar, which is information sharing. This is different from the fourth pillar because it is about sh the sharing of information between financial entities. DORA explicitly permits financial entities to establish mutual arrangement for information exchange on cyber threats. And in doing so, the aim is to increase the awareness of ICT risks and to limit their spread. Open communication supports defensive capabilities and threat detection techniques. Governance and risk management, testing of operational resilience, third-party risk management, supervisory reporting of incidents, and information sharing. These five pillars constitute the fundamentals of DORA. But, as previously mentioned, this is only a very brief and high-level summary. DORA contains 64 articles resulting in almost 100 pages of legislative text, so for months we have endeavored to prepare the sector as much as possible for the arrival of DORA. And we will continue to do so until F DORA is fully enacted on the 17th of January 2025. We've increased awareness through various seminars, communications and survey. We're facilitating the integration of DORA into the Belgian legal order. Under the auspices of the ESAs, we have created so-called Level 2 texts, which further clarify certain areas of DORA. We've developed the necessary IT tools and processes for uh, data collection and dissemination. We're adapting supervisory methodologies, and we're preparing for the impact that the oversight of critical third parties will have on the NBB. It has been a long endeavor, with still much to do, but when everything is said and done and DORA is fully enacted, we have a lot to look forward to. A financial sector with improved digital resilience, ready and capable to handle the demands of the future. A harmonious approach to supervision and digital risk management, regardless of which EU member the entity or supervisory authority is based in. And this harmonization extends to existing regulation because DORA will be considered lex specialis meaning that on more horizontal legislation, such as the NIST II directive, uh, institutions that fall under DORA can limit themselves to compliance with DORA provisions from then on. And with that, the final topic of today has been wrapped up. The FMI report itself is, of course, much broader and richer than these brief uh, presentations. And the full report will be made available on our public set on our public website. We will now commence the Q&A.
Thank you, Nikolai, Durin, Janice, and Joffrey for your interesting presentations. Uh, I see the audience has some questions. Uh, Nikolai, let's start with the two questions related to SWIFT. Um, first question, is SWIFT secure for hackers? Well, <clears throat> that's, that's a good question, and I guess that's the whole purpose of how, how SWIFT, they themselves are securing their operations and also the purpose of our work to make sure that they are well protected. Now, can you give assurance for 100% that they are fully protected? No one can ever give that uh, assurance, but, but still it is the whole purpose and that's why we have all these discussions with SWIFT. Um, so you need to know that there are cyber security frameworks, um, all of our international guidance is inspired um, by these. Um, well, one in interesting reference is the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Typically, there are best practices and measures to be taken in four areas like identify, detect, protect and recover. Um, you will see that these areas come back in many international legislations, um, the cyber resilience guidance from CBMI and EOSCO, but also DORA is inspired by this structure, by, by this structure. Um, <clears throat> now, given the criticality of SWIFT, of course, um, we probably can ask more from SWIFT or we expect SWIFT to do more than a smaller organization. Um, and that's also why we expect them to be very vigilant for new vulnerabilities being uh, made public um, and also why we are discussing with them extreme but plausible scenarios and discussing then with them how they can well protect by taking additional measures. Um, so that would be my answer. You never can give 100% assurance, but the idea really is to make sure that they are well protected. All right. Um, you also <coughs> explained that you are currently working on a review of the SWIFT oversight framework. Does that mean that the scope of this SWIFT oversight will change? And if so, can you give some examples? Huh. Um, the, the, the ultimate objective will remain the same. So we are very much interested in the operational continuity and resilience of the services. It's only the way in which we codify things that is changing. Um, and so um, we, we had these of we, ha we have these five high-level expectations that I was talking about. They are really high level. If you compare that um, to a codification of expectations that, for instance, financial institutions will now have with the DORA Act. Um, and so what we aim to do through a Belgian law is to also codify our expectations. Now, um, under the high-level expectations, our actual demands from SWIFT have considerably evolved over the years. Um, we are now codifying that in, into legislation. Um, but if there is one area that I would like to mention where I do think that we will be asking more, um, it's the specific area of governance. Um, in, in terms of governance expectations, we will set more specific expectations. For instance, up until now, we, we did not have a clear definition on what constitute independent directors. Um, and so we expect that there will be independent directors going forward at SWIFT. And for certain appointments, we would also apply um, fit and proper approaches. So that means that, that we uh, check uh, whether people are fit and uh, proper um, to execute specific functions that we consider key in the organization. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, we also received a question for uh, Doreen. Uh, Doreen, you mentioned several possible negative impacts, risk and challenges. Um, do institutions also see opportunities and, and what can they do to tackle climate related risks? Institutions definitely also see oppor business opportunities and they also believe that they can play a role and they s distinguish themselves three different roles. Firstly, they believe that they can reduce their own impact by taking measures. Secondly, they also believe that they can encourage and inspire the other stakeholders in the financial sector 
as they play a central role, they can put the topic on the agenda of events and conferences they organize. They can participate in sector initiatives, and they can also try to encourage or even impose requirements on their third party service providers. And finally, they can also uh, offer uh, and develop new services and products which will help and support the clients and the customers to reach their goals. An example in the more CSD and custodian world is, for example, support for the issuance of green bonds and, and green collateral pools. Okay, thank you, Doreen. I will continue with the question for Janice. Um, Janice, what other risks are there besides the mentioned litigation uh, risk? Yes, um, so I think I, I briefly mentioned um, maybe that there is operational and compliance risk. Um, operational risk because the application of sanctions um, um, br um, means that some of the processes are broken, like the straight through processing, and that then means that there's a lot more manual processing, which is of course much more prone to errors. Um, and that then also has the compliance risk uh, perspective in there too, because if there's an error, there is a, a compliance risk. Um, another compliance risk is the fact that um, the, the sanctions environment, the international sanction packages are complex. There are some differences also in jurisdictions. So uh, you really need to clearly understand what are the obligations where and then also identify properly um, the relevant connections, uh, whether it be to Russia or um, the relevant jurisdictions that have adopted sanctions regulation. Okay, thank you, Janice. Um, let's go to Geoffrey for uh, one final question. Geoffrey, how does DORA compare to existing international standards, such as uh, ISO 27000? Is having the right certification sufficient to be compliant with DORA? Well, if an organization has an internationally recognized uh, certification, then we do take that into account, but that on its own is not sufficient. We always perform our own, uh, our own analysis because otherwise we would rely on the word of an external party to fulfill our mandate, and we cannot do that. So the legislative text speaks for itself. You can uh, rely on other companies to help you with compliance, and we will always rely on our own work and our own analysis. Okay, this concludes our uh, Q&A. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for their attendance and attention. We will provide a link to the recording and the FMI report. Um, I kindly ask you to complete the short satisfaction questionnaire. Um, it should take only a few minutes of your time and your feedback is very helpful and, and will allow us to improve our webinars. We wish you a lovely afternoon and hope to see you soon at one of our upcoming events. Have a nice day.